And if you have your Bible with you this morning, I hope you do. We're in Psalm 137 as we continue with our with our Psalm series. If you are ages 8, 9, 10, 11, no, 9, 10, 11, 12, you can go to Sunday Superb. It is time for that. Psalm 137. I'm going to teach you a new word, probably new for most of you, one you don't use very often, but it's the word imprecation. Everybody say it. Imprecation. Imprecation is a word that comes, here's what they say about it on vocabulary.com. More than simply the use of bad language, although that can be involved too, an imprecation is a damning curse wishing someone else nothing but evil. Originally from the Latin, which means to invoke evil or to bring down bad spirits upon. That's what an imprecation is. Now the reason we're learning that word is because we're in this series on the Psalms, the short summer series on this. We've looked at a psalm of praise already. We've looked at a royal psalm. Last week we looked at a psalm of lament. And this week we're going to look at one of the dozen or so psalms that you find in the Bible that are imprecatory psalms, psalms of imprecation, psalms of cursing. You ever had the experience of reading something in the Bible and going, I don't know that that belongs in the Bible. I remember having that experience the first time I read in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And I got to this part in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 where the preacher says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. I've applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It's an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, it's all vanity and striving after the wind. Life is unhappy and meaningless. Praise the Lord, right? I mean, I read that the first time. I thought, that doesn't sound right to me. And the first time I read Psalm 137, and got to the end of the psalm, I said, wait a sec, that's in the Bible? In fact, if we're going to understand why Psalm 137 is as inspired as Psalm 23 or John 3.16, we're going to have to do a little digging and get into some of the historical context in which this psalm is written. So we're going to read it together. Before we do that, let's pray for God to give us illumination into this. Pray with me. Father, we believe that every word you have spoken to us, every word in your Bible is true. It's from you. And so we come now to align our minds and our hearts to study and to meditate on your word. We come believing that you, Holy Spirit, will work in our lives this morning to refashion us into the likeness of Jesus as we submit ourselves to the instruction of your word. Speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you read along as I read this, Psalm 137. It really starts as a psalm of lament and then gets to imprecation at the end. So here we go. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our lyres, for our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, the against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, lay it bare, lay it bare, down to the foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed. Blessed shall be he who repays you what you have done to us. Blessed shall be he who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Amen. May God bless this reading of his word. Now I told you last week when we studied Psalm 13 that it had a special uh, alignment with my life because we sang a choral version of Psalm 13 when I was in high school and that was very meaningful for me meaningful for me. I remember singing a part of Psalm 137 when I was in high school because our high school choir did Godspell that year. And there is a song in Godspell that is on the willows there. We hung up our lyres. It's verses 2, 3, and 4 from Psalm 137. So I remember singing that and I thought, 
I wonder what psalm this is from. And so I went to the Bible and I read all of Psalm 137 and I got to dashing the kids on the rocks and I went, what? And I don't know, I, I mean, I didn't get an answer then. And in fact, as we were working through this series, I thought, I, I really need to dig into Psalm 137 for myself so that I have an answer that satisfies me about why this is in the Bible and why God wants us to not only speak it, but sing it to him how this fits into our lives. So he, here's the outline we're going to follow this morning. We're going to look at the historical setting for this psalm, Psalm 137, and then we're going to look at the four movements that I see in the psalm. Then we're going to look at the whole subject of imprecatory psalms in the Bible. And finally, we're going to talk about imprecatory psalms in our lives in the 21st century. Are, are these things we should be singing and praying and and, and is this a part of what should be our spiritual dynamic? So first, the historical setting for the psalm. This is a later psalm. This is not one of the psalms of David. This was written, we're not exactly sure by whom, but it was written probably 400 years after the time of David. In fact, this is going to be a review for a lot of you, but it took me about 15 or 20 years as a Christian before I started to get my head around the chronology of the Old Testament. If you had come up to me as a young Christian and you have said, who came first, Moses or David, I would not have had any idea. If you had said to me, where, where does the Exodus fit into the history of Israel, I would not have known that. And maybe some of you are still trying to get your minds around that. So I'm going to walk you through a timeline of the big times in Old Testament history. If I was doing this with American history, I would say, you know, 1492, and then you got the early 1600s and Plymouth Rock, and then we'd jump ahead to 1776 and Declaration of Independence, and then we'd get to the Civil War pretty quick, and we'd talk about great people in American history. We'd talk about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. So we're just going to get the highlights, kind of the 2,000-year scope of Israel with the big moments in their history. So the first one in the timeline is Abraham, about 2100 B.C., Abraham is called out of Ur of the Chaldees to come and to start a new land in, in what becomes Israel. And attached to Abraham are his descendants, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. So the first 200 years, the book of Genesis is all about this family and how the, the promised land got founded. And that takes about a 200-year period. Then you get to 1900, and that's when Joseph goes to Egypt and the family goes down to Egypt because there's a famine in, in, in Israel. And they spend the next 400 years in Egypt. First, they're down there, and it's all working out fine. Pretty quickly, they become slaves in Egypt. And they spend 400 years in slavery and oppression to the pharaohs in Egypt. This was a big chapter in Israel's history. 400 years. Think about that. If, if 1600 is when we got started, it's now 20, what, what is it? What, 2108? No, 2008. Anyway, we've had about that same amount of time. They were in slavery the whole time. Okay? At the end of that, God raises up Moses, and that brings about the Exodus. So Moses is raised up. He goes to Pharaoh, let my people go. I put Aaron in there too because Aaron is, is Moses' ally in all of this. Let my people go. Pharaoh says no. God brings the plagues. You've seen the movie, right? The Red Sea parts, and they go out, uh, in, and they, then they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And at the end of that 40 years, God leads them into the Promised Land, which is next. That's Joshua and the judges starting at about 1400 B.C. and continuing again for another 400 or so years. This is the settling of the Promised Land. The 12 tribes of Israel wind up in different places throughout the Promised Land, and uh, Joshua leads them in. The judges rule during that 400-year period, but at the end of that 400-year period, they all get together and say, you know, all the other nations have a king. We want a king, too. And that's when things change for Israel, when they go from being this, this uh, kingdom of tribes with judges ruling everywhere, they now become a kingdom under a king. And they, they say, we want Saul, he's tall and he's good looking, and he's the first king of Israel, but he's a bad king. So then God raises up David. So the, the big three kings at about 1000 BC, Saul, then David, then Saul's, or David's son Solomon. And that begins this era of kingly worship in Israel, but it doesn't last long because the next thing is the divided kingdom. So about 850 BC, the kingdom divides into the north and the south. They split, there's a king in the north, there's a king in the south. 
ten tribes up in the north, two tribes down in the south, and the kingdom is divided in there. From 850 B.C. until the next event, which is 722 B.C., you've got kings ruling in different areas, but in 722 B.C., the northern kingdom gets conquered by the Assyrians. The Assyrian king Sennacherib, who was a bloodthirsty, ruthless, barbaric king, he comes into the north. Now, Assyria would be modern-day Syria, so you get the connection. He comes from the north into the northern kingdom, and he conquers, eventually conquering what had been the capital city or the city of worship in, in um, the northern kingdom, the Samaritan, the Samarian region, Samaria, all of that gets conquered. The tribes are now the slaves of the Assyrians. And Sennacherib keeps marching down. He's going to just continue his conquest. His next plan is to take Jerusalem. So in 721, here come the armies of Sennacherib and the Assyrians, and they're going to conquer the capital city of the south, which, which is Jerusalem, and put an end to the entire uh, nation of Israel. But if, if you've read your Bible, you know what happens. As, as the siege is forming and as the troops are aligning around the city of Jerusalem, the, the, Jerusalem had fortified the city walls. They had brought water in to make sure that they were okay. They had cut off the water supplies for, for the Assyrian army. So the Assyrian army is around Israel. Israel is protected in Jerusalem. But they're getting ready to attack, and Isaiah, the prophet, goes to the king, and he says, we need to cry out to the Lord. They cry out to the Lord, sackcloth and ashes. They repent of their apostasy, and God delivers them. And in one night, in 721 B.C., well, I'll, I'll read to you what it says. In this one night, the Lord, this is uh, Isaiah 37. Isaiah 36 and 37 is where you read about this. Therefore... Uh, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mount against it. By the way he came, that same way he shall return, and he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 Assyrians in the camp of the Assyrians, and when people arose early the next morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. And Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived in Nineveh. So they're getting ready for the attack. They wake up one morning, there are 185,000 people dead on the ground, your soldiers. And Sennacherib goes, okay, we're not doing the attack. Right? Now this is critical in our thinking. This is an important moment in Israel's history and the, the significance here, this is roughly 720 B.C. Everybody's rejoicing and praising God. Somewhere in the back of their mind they're thinking this. You know, Jerusalem, God will always protect Jerusalem. We are impenetrable. Armies cannot come against us. God's on our side. He wasn't with the people in the north, but he's with Judah. He's with us in the south. So here's what happens with Israel following this victory. Th these people become spiritually complacent. They begin to ignore the worship of Yahweh. They start to mix in the worship of pagan gods and idols. They think to themselves, you know, we may not be the center of the Middle East the way, way we were when David was the king, but we're, we're fine. We can take care of ourselves, and we are God's favorite, and nobody can defeat us. And you know what happened. They eventually fell to the Babylonians. The Babylonians would eventually invade and conquer. This happened in 568. The southern kingdom, Judah, falls to the Babylonians. In fact, the Babylonian attack on Jerusalem, which was a, a successful attack, was a ruthless, barbaric attack. When these armies came in, they laid Jerusalem to waste. They demolished the buildings, they set on fire the buildings, they ravaged the Jewish women, and they killed the Jewish babies. When you're invading, you don't take babies prisoner, they're just an inconvenience. I mean, soldiers don't want babies to have to mess with, they want young boys and, and strong men. And so they would come in, and they would rape the women, and they would kill the babies. So the destruction of Jerusalem led to that. Now, why did Jerusalem fall to the Babylonians? Why didn't God intervene this time and kill 185,000 
Babylonians? Well, we don't have the specific answer, but you look at the practice of, of the Jews during that time, and here's what you find. They had become spiritually complacent, and that spiritual complacency had led to compromise, and that compromise had led to arrogance. And let me just suggest to you that this is a common pathway to spiritual destruction, not just for nations, but for individuals. To become spiritually complacent about your life, to just put your life on spiritual cruise control, where you just kind of coast along and, yeah, maybe every once in a while you'll read a devotional book or something, but, you know, life is going okay and you don't really need it and things are busy and you just become spiritually complacent. What happens is that spiritual complacency begins to lead to spiritual compromise. And you start looking at things you shouldn't be looking at, or you start acting ways you shouldn't be acting, or you, you, you start to step out of, you're, you're now relying on your own strength and not walking by the Spirit, and so the flesh starts to emerge in your life in more and more ways. Spiritual complacency leads to compromise, and that leads to arrogance. If you can get along without God, you start to think, you know what? I'm doing all right. And now you are ripe for destruction. Because in that moment, God will get the attention of his children by allowing your kingdom to crumble. And, and I'll just say here, this is, this, this is where we need to be on guard and ask ourselves a question. Are we spiritually complacent in our own lives today? Are we coasting? Cruise control spirituality. Got our lives on spiritual autopilot. The, the back to school time of the year, it's a good time of year to just kind of recalibrate, renew disciplines that have atrophied over the summer. I mean, I usually think September and January are kind of those two reset times for your life spiritually. And if you have over the summer allowed your life to get into kind of spiritual doldrums and complacency and you just let things go and you had vacation, you had this, you had that, all right, this is, this is a good recalibration. Don't just continue to drift in complacency because that will lead to compromise and that will lead to arrogance. Complacency to compromise, compromise to arrogance, and arrogance will lead you to what author Sheldon Van Ocken called a severe mercy a severe mercy where God will mercifully come in and bring discipline into your life. If you don't want to get it, he'll, he'll get your attention. He will, he will bring discipline, not as punishment, but to get you back on the right path. Okay, can I be clear here? God doesn't bring hard things into your life to punish you. The punishment you deserve, God has taken care of in Christ. God, God does not punish his children. God disciplines his children. There's a difference. Punishment is where, where you want retribution. God has poured out retribution on Christ. Discipline is where you try to get somebody headed back in the right direction. And that's what God did with Israel. The Babylonian attack, the Babylonian uh, conquest over Jerusalem was re-getting the attention of his people and waking them up to their spiritual complacency. And yes, it was a hard season that lasted 50 plus years in Babylon in captivity but it brought spiritual renewal when they came back into the land and they rebuilt the city after the fall of Jerusalem the Babylonians take about 50,000 Jews back to Babylon with them as slaves and Jerusalem's left in ruins and yeah you don't see the last thing they returned to Israel back in 520, uh, 525 BC that's when the return to Israel happens so that's the timeline but you go back and, and you say okay when, when they destroyed Jerusalem they killed a lot of women and children. They took about 50,000 women and men and, uh, with them as slaves back to Babylon. They left very few people back in the land. And I give you all of that because that's the context for in which Psalm 137 is written. Jerusalem's been destroyed. The kids have been killed. Mom and dad have been taken away. They're now slaves in Babylon, 50,000 strong. And we don't know how long into the Babylonian captivity this psalm was written, but they're writing a lament of being out of Zion in Babylon and crying out for God to bring justice against those who are not only their captors, but those who were barbaric in their, in their treatment of them. I told you there are four movements in the psalm, in Psalm 137. Here are the four movements we're going to look at. The first four verses are the lament over Zion. 
Now, just to make sure you know, Zion and Jerusalem are just two names for the same thing. Okay? So when you hear them talking about Zion, they're talking about the city of Jerusalem. They're talking about the place where God lives. Mount Zion is Jerusalem. So the first four verses are the lament over Zion. The next two verses are the psalmist pledging his loyalty to Jerusalem, to Zion. Then there's one verse, verse 7, where the psalmist curses the Edomites, an impreca imprecation against the Edomites. And then there's cursing the Babylonians, the last two. That's an imprecation against the Babylonians. So let's walk through those four movements, okay? The lament over Zion. Start at verse 1. By the waters of Babylon. You know what the waters of Babylon are? The Tigris and the Euphrates. Those are the two rivers that come together in the Fertile Crescent. That's where Babylon was. It's, it's in that area. So by these, by these mighty rivers of Babylon, the Tigris and the Euphrates, we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. This is not just weeping over some real estate. This is people lamenting what the loss of Jerusalem, the loss of the land, means for them. Here's the new reality for the people of Judah. They were once free and now they're slaves. They were once living in peace and prosperity. They are now under the watchful eye of the armed guards. They were once living as families. They've been separated now. Their slave owners don't care whether husband and wife are together. They destroy family units. In fact, the kids have been killed. They're still grieving the loss of loved ones. They were once living in a familiar ancestral homeland where their parents had lived and their grandparents had lived, and now they're in a strange land 900 miles away from home where everything looks unusual. It's a different culture. They don't fit in. They were once full of hope. Now they're hopeless. So it's no wonder they sit down and weep, weep when they remember Zion. You know, up until a couple of years ago, life was pretty good for them. Before the battle, before their homeland was destroyed, life was pretty good, and now they're in bondage as slaves. And with this loss of ho hope comes the loss of joy. Look at verse 2. On the willows there we hung up our lyres. We put our instruments away. For there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Now these, these are not people who feel much like singing the songs. I mean... When you are a slave in Babylon, you don't feel like singing psalms about how your God is greater than all the gods of the rest of the world, right? And you can imagine the tormentors here, the guards, who are just taunting them. They're, they're just saying, to them, why don't you get your instruments and sing us one of those, you know, one of those songs that you guys used to sing where you'd sing and dance about how great your God is? Sing us one of those. We'd like to hear that. In fact, they might say, I remember this one you guys used to sing, Psalm 48. Sing that one for us. Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. Sing that one. You know, sing about how great Jerusalem is, the city of the king, the great fortress. Behold, the kings assembled. They came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Yeah, sing that one about how all the other kings ran away when they saw your city. Trembling took hold of them there. Anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind you shattered the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of our Lord, the, the city of the Lord of hosts, the city of our God, which God will establish forever. Sing us that one about how Jerusalem's going to be established forever. We'd like to hear you sing that one and dance around a little bit when you do that. We've thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O God, so your praise reaches the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion, go around her, number her towers, consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is God, the God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. Why don't you guys get your harps down and play that song for us? You see the mockery? And, and you can imagine if you're a Jew and you're being told, sing that song that is obviously not true. Sing that song about how great your God is when it's clear He's not as great as you've said he was. 
This is not just we're sad because we're not living in our, our land. This is really a crisis of faith. This is the Babylonians. The, the people of Israel were looking around and going, okay, maybe our God's not as great. Maybe, maybe the Babylonian God is the right God. That's the thinking of the people. So when they sit down and they, they write this psalm, they are reminding themselves in this psalm of how great Jerusalem really is. In fact, that's, that's the next segment. But before I get to the next segment, who, who remembers where you were on December 29th, 2014? That date ring a bell for anybody? That was the day that Brandon Allen led the Razorbacks to a 31-7 victory over the Texas Longhorns in the Texas Bowl. The Hogs were 6-6. Six and six. Texas was 6-6. Six and six. They looked evenly matched. It was not a contest. Brandon Allen threw for 160 yards uh, and two touchdowns. Texas was limited to a total of 58 yards of total offense. Hallelujah. I mean, that's just a great... Right? Now imagine that at the end of that game, after that crushing defeat, imagine the Razorbacks had walked over to the Texas locker room and said, hey guys, sing us your fight song. You know that one about the eyes of Texas are upon you and how everybody scatters when the Longhorns come. Go ahead and sing us your fight song. We'd like to hear that one. Go ahead and sing it loud. That kind of taunting, that kind of, that, that's a little bit of what the Jews are feeling here when the captors say, a little more singing and dancing about how great your God is. And they say, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How do we sing this? How do we sing about the greatness of God when we're slaves in Babylon? And then, then they call themselves back to a pledge and a vow. And this is the third movement. If I forget, no, the second movement. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Again, this is not just a pledge to a piece of real estate, to an address or a city or a hill. This is a pledge of loyalty to the God who has made them a nation and has made promises to them. They're saying our faith is still in God and in Jerusalem. Even though we're slaves in Babylon, we, we are pledging ourselves to be faithful to our God. There are th These are people who would come together every year, the Jews, and they would celebrate in the Passover how God delivered them from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. So as they remember that story, they're remembering, you know, God did this before. When we were slaves in Egypt, he brought us back into the land. God can do that. He's done it. He can do it again. They are not giving up hope that God still has a plan for them and for their nation and that the land is the land of promise. Remember, for the, the Jews, Zion is not just their their home. It's where God lives. They, they see Mount Zion as the, the habitation of God. The temple is his house. Jerusalem is his city. So when they say setting Jerusalem above my highest joy, it's a reaffirmation that being in the place where God dwells is really the happiest place on earth. Forget what Disney says, right? To, to be in the place where God dwells, the psalmist says it elsewhere where he says better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. So I'm going to set my highest joy on being where God is. And then we move to the two curses, the two imprecations. After they've lamented where they are, and then they pledge themselves, I'm going to be faithful to God. Now the two imprecations. The first one is against the Edomites. The Edomites in verse 7. Remember the Lord... Uh, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, when they said, lay it bare, lay it bare, down to the foundations. Now, the Edomites, you know who the Edomites are? They're the descendants of, anybody know? Esau. They're Esau's descendants. So when Jacob and Esau had their split, Jacob's kids became Israel. Esau's kids became the Edomites. And can we put the map up there? Yeah, so this is... This is the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom. See where Jericho is there at the top? That's the northern kingdom up above that. And the kingdom of Edom is down here to the south. That's where Esau's inhabitants lived. The reason I show you this is because you, you see Jerusalem up there with the star at the top. When Jerusalem was surrounded, it would have been nice if their cousins from Edom would have come and maybe helped them out a little bit, been allies in the battle against Babylon. 
but they were not allies. In fact, they were cheering on the Babylonians. The, the, the Edomites were saying, lay it bare, lay it bare down at the foundation. They were cheerleaders for the Babylonians. So here the first imprecation is, God, remember the Edomites. They didn't help us out. They didn't give us refuge. They didn't give us support in the battle. Remember that, God, and judge them for that. We read about this, it, 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 probably a book you've not spent a lot of time meditating on, but the book of Obadiah, one chapter, small prophet, is all about how the Edomites did not support Israel during the siege in Babylon. In fact, Obadiah verse 10, because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day you stand aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, the foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. Do not gloat over the day of your brother, the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Don't gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Don't loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Don't stand at the crossroads to cut off the, his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. Obadiah saying to the Edomites, Look, you didn't help us out. You better cry out to mercy because what's, what you did to us, God's going to do to you. That's, a, that's an imprecation, isn't it? That's calling down a curse on the Edomites for the way that they handled things. Well, Obadiah, the book of Obadiah, is a commentary on Psalm 137, verse 7, when he says, remember, Lord, the Edomites, when they were saying, raise it, tear it down, tear it down. Remember that. This is a cry for God to bring vengeance and to repay evil for evil. And that's the same idea we get in these last two verses of Psalm 137, the imprecation against Babylon. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed. Notice the confident boldness of this statement. <laughs> these are slaves sitting by the river, not playing their harps. They got no hope, and they say, O daughters of Babylon, you are doomed to be destroyed. God's going to rescue us. Your destruction is coming. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Our God is higher than any other. You may be ruling over us now, but our God will deliver us just as, just as he delivered us from the hand of Pharaoh in Egypt, and they were made to pay for how they oppressed God's people. The same is going to happen to you. And then, blessed shall be he who repays you for what you've done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rocks. Again, this was the common practice in war. You take over a city, you capture the able-bodied people and make slaves of them, you kill the kids. In fact, some have suggested it was more humane to kill the kids than it was to let them starve to death or, or to let them suffer, that this was putting them out of the misery that was coming their way. So when, when at the end of this psalm, the psalmist says, blessed is the one who takes your kids and dashes them against the rocks, they're basically saying, blessed is the one who overthrows your country, the, who, who does to you what you did to us in Jerusalem, and who, who ends the Babylonian Empire, which, by the way, happened in 529 when King Darius came through and when you had the Medo-Persian invasion of Babylon. Now, in that context, that verse makes a little more sense, right? But let's talk about this whole idea of imprecation, because this still, here's, here's the problem with what we read here. You've read your New Testament, right? Don't repay evil for evil. Give a blessing instead. Love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. How can, how can that be what we're taught in the New Testament? And we read stuff like this and go, that doesn't sound very godly. Well, about 10% of the Psalms in the hymn book of Israel about 10% of them are imprecatory psalms. If you want to do a, you can look them up. Psalm 7, 35, 40, 55, 59, 69, 83, 94, 109, 137, 140, 144. Uh, 14 of those psalms are, have, are, are dominated with imprecatory language. There are 
imprecatory phrases in other psalms, where in the middle of a psalm of praise there just might be, O oh God, arise, let your, enemy, uh, your, let your enemies be destroyed. There has been thought through the years by some Bible commentators, they look at these imprecatory psalms and they say, these are outbursts of human anger, but it's sinful human anger. They've said, God, God is acknowledging sinful human anger in these psalms. He's not condoning it. In fact, C.S. Lewis called the imprecatory psalms devilish and wicked. In his book, Reflections on the Psalms, C.S. Lewis said, we should not somehow condone or approve of these statements, and it's worse yet if we use these psalms to somehow justify our own similar passions. And I would agree. You should not read this and say, oh, it's okay for me to have vengeful thoughts boiling up in my heart against my enemies. Peter Craig, who wrote this commentary on the psalms, here's what he said about the imprecatory psalms. He said, the words of the psalmist are often natural and spontaneous, not always pure and good. And then he concluded, these psalms are not the oracles of God. Now we've got a problem there, right? I mean, when, when you start looking at the imprecatory psalms and going, I don't know what to do with these, they must not fit here. They must just be God allowing for human passion and emotion, but this is not really God speaking to us. With all due respect to these men, I think God has given us the imprecatory psalms as a way to make sure that we do not become so overwhelmed by God's grace and his mercy that we lose sight of God's justice and his holiness. I think the imprecatory psalms are in here so that as, as we calibrate our understanding of the, of the holiness and the perfection of God, we remember that he is a God who will repay his enemies. God is a God of mercy and grace, but there is a coming day of the Lord when justice will be executed, and it's right and good that God should do that. And we have to remember this. J.I. Packer says of psalms like this one, they are voicing a zeal and a passion for God's glory, for the triumph of his cause and his righteousness, which far exceeds ours. We read these psalms and we have to remember to tremble before the Lord who will bring justice and righteousness against those who are his enemies. So a few, a few things to keep in mind as you read in precatory psalms. First of all, when the psalmist expresses this, most often it's not a personal, it, it's not a cry for vengeance against a personal affront. It's more a cry for justice against the divine, venge, divine vengeance against God's name and God's glory being assaulted. Now, you've read the Psalms of David where David says, Lord, vindicate me. Lord, defend me against my enemies. But in saying that, what David is saying is, God, you've called me to be king. My enemies are opposing me, so Lord, defend yourself here. Bring vengeance against those who oppose your will and your way. It's not, God, they cut me off in, in traffic. Curse them. Right? This is not David with some momentary outburst of, I was inconvenienced. I was made to suffer, so make them suffer. This is David saying, God, these are people who are against your plan and your will. Lord, Bring vengeance. Bring justice on those people. The, number two, the imprecatory psalms are in sync with what God has already promised to do. He has promised to bring judgment on the wicked. When you call out, God, judge the wicked, you are aligning your own heart and mind with what God has said he's already going to do. You are saying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, you promised that you will you'll put an end to evil and that you will judge the wicked. Lord, do it. And then these Psalms and the Old Testament, keep this in mind, this is not the only place where words of imprecation are spoken. You find it in the New Testament too. Like when Paul is talking to the Galatians and he says, if anybody brings a gospel other than the one I preached, what does he say? Let them be accursed. Damn them to hell. Bring judgment on them. At the end of 1 Corinthians, as Paul is wrapping up his letter, he says this, If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. These are words of imprecation. And we looked at Romans 12 just a few months ago, you remember? And at the end of Romans 12, it says, 
if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And then it says, never avenge for yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. This is New Testament. This is gospel. Don't go out and seek vengeance. Don't try to re get evil paid for on your own. God will take care of this. He has promised he will execute vengeance against the wicked. And remember Jesus giving directions to the disciples when he sent them out to preach to the cities? Luke chapter 10, he says, Whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. In other words, they oppose you, guess what's going to happen? Judgment. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. It'll be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You'll be brought down to Hades. This is Jesus. Remember? This is the one who says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, which is still true. But know this, God will bring justice and judgment on his enemies. One more. Look at Revelation 6, how the martyrs there are crying out for justice. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And by the way, it's right for God to bring judge, justice and judgment on the wicked and on those who oppose him. The point is, it's not just the Old Testament where you see imprecation. It's in the New Testament as well. So let me bring this into our day. What about imprecatory psalms in 2018? Should we be praying these things? How should we understand these? Well, first of all, imprecatory psalms should remind us when you think about what happened in, within the Babylonian uh, attack on Jerusalem and the barbarism and the, the inhumanity of that attack, there was no Geneva Convention that was, that was governing that war. These were barbaric, bloodthirsty men who, who quickly and innocently killed human beings. And, and by the way, apart from God's restraining grace in our world in our day, this is happening all over the place in our world in our day. W would you say that the 20th century was a, was a century of great human progress or a century of great barbarism? Well, it was both. I mean, we saw progress. But there were world wars and civil wars in the 20th century where 50 to 60 million people died. One century... 50 to 60 million people died in world wars or in civil wars. And, and on top of that, that's nothing compared to, in the 20th century, to, to governments that killed their own people in genocides. There, were an est there are estimates of 170 million people in the 20th century who were killed by their own governments in the former Soviet Union. In China, you, you can go through uh, what happened in Bosnia. You can go through what happened in, in uh, Rwanda, the Rwandan genocide. You can go through Pol Pot and the Cambodian killing fields. I mean, we could just go through list after list. Pinochet, Idi Amin. Th these were not people who, who simply executed people. Th this was barbarism. The top government killers in the 20th century Soviet Union, 62 million estimated deaths in the Soviet Union from 1917 to 1987. 62 million of their people killed. People's Republic of China, between 49 and 87, 35 million people. And, and you know the Chinese and the Japanese and their fighting and the, the, the Bushida Code and, and, again, barbaric. In distant third are the Nazis, who killed 16 million Jews and Slavs and Serbs and Czechs and Poles and Ukrainians, anyone they deemed as misfits, the mentally ill, homosexuals, 
all murdered under Nazism. Three weeks ago today, Mary Ann and I were on a bus and we drove by this building. This is an aerial view of the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg, Germany. In courtroom 600 inside the Palace of Justice in 1946, the, those who were still alive and captured who had been the leaders of the Third Reich were put on trial in an international court in the Nuremberg trials for crimes against humanity. At the end of the war, they said, when you men followed Hitler's orders, you should have resisted. These were You were being called upon to commit crimes against humanity, and they were tried and convicted. In that, here's the street view. Show the street view. So you drive by. This is still a working courtroom in Nuremberg. And the trials were held here for two reasons. One, because this building was still standing at the end of the war, a, a large building where this could go on. But the other reason is it's just a couple of miles from the parade grounds where Hitler would routinely bring out his goose-stepping soldiers and would show off his military might for all the world to see. So in one way, they held the trial in his own backyard from where Nazism had flourished. Now, you don't have to think very hard. You don't have to look very far to understand that to call out down imprecation on the people who led the Third Reich, to think Adolf Hitler deserves the wrath of God for what he did, and that he was not just an enemy of the United States, he was an enemy of God. When he rounded up Jews and took them to the death camps, he was saying, I'm God. I decide who deserves to live and die. And you look at pictures like these pictures that come from the Holocaust. In the death camps, the kids, the bunks, the boneyards that were found later. And the, the ovens. These three stones, I want to tell you about these three stones. Two days after we were in Nurman, Nuremberg, we were in Regensburg on a city tour, and our tour guide took us off the main street into a little alleyway, and there were three stones in the street, on a side street, three brass plates right down on the pavement where the cobblestone had been removed and these brass plates had been put in. These are not the ones we saw, but these are like the ones. These are called Schulpersteins or Schulpersteins. That's German for stumbling stones. In 1992, a German artist began work on a project placing these stumbling stones in front of the businesses or the houses of men and women who had been taken off to the death camps in d during the, the time of the Holocaust. So their last known work address or home address, they would put one of these stones out in there. And you can see on these stones, so this is Hugo and Paula and Eva. And you can see when they were born, 1896, 1907, 18, or 1933. So little Eva was just a child. And you can see they were deported on February 26, 1943. All of them sent to Auschwitz, Paula and Eva, Imordet, that's where they died, was in Auschwitz. We don't know the date. Hugo was moved to Natzweiler, a different camp, and he was killed in August of 1943. There were 16 million people killed in the Holocaust. Right now there are 67,000 of these stones in Germany and around Europe commemorating the people who had died. And every one of those stumbling stones is a cry for justice. It's, it's an acknowledgement of the humanity that was robbed of these people. In God's economy, listen, in God's economy, every sin against, every sin is a sin against him. The deaths of Hugo and Paula and evil, Eva and the millions of others, th these were a sin against a holy God who gave these people life and who gave them dignity with his own image stamped on their soul. Every sin is a sin against God, and every sin requires a payment. Every sin requires a payment. Every sin you have committed, every sin I have committed, every sin that was committed in these atrocities requires a payment, and the payment will be, ex will, will be paid one way or another. 
either the sinner will pay for it himself with his own life or the sin will be put on Christ who has paid the price. The sins are all going to be paid for. There's no sin that's ever been committed where God says, okay, forget that one. No, it's going to be paid for, either in Christ or by the one who commits it. Who's going to pay for your sins? That's the key question here. Who will pay for your sins? Are you an enemy of God upon whom imprecation is appropriate? Or have you surrendered to the God who, who has called you to himself and have you accepted what Christ has done for you? Have you surrendered your life to him that you can have eternal life with him because he's paid for your sins? That's what we celebrate when we celebrate communion. We celebrate the fact that our sins, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, our sins not in part but the whole are nailed to the cross and we bear them no more. The psalms of imprecation are about us hating what God hates. I'm gonna, as, as we prepare to come to the table this morning, I'm going to give you three quotes to end things here this morning. Here's the first quote. It's from Proverbs 8. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. One who is aligned with God, it, one who fears the Lord, hates evil. Do you hate evil? Do you hate it in our world? Do you hate it when it shows up in your own heart? Second quote, this is from theologian Johannes Voss, says, we need imprecatory psalms to align our lives against Satan and against the kind of evil God hates. He says, God's kingdom cannot come without Satan's kingdom being destroyed. God's will cannot be done in earth without the destruction of evil. Evil cannot be destroyed without the destruction of men who are permanently identified with it. So he says, instead of being influenced by the sickly sen sentimentalism of our day, Christian people should realize the glory of God demands the destruction of evil. And we should pray, Lord, vindicate yourself and judge the wicked. Final word this morning comes from somebody who realized that his own life, in his own life, that none of us has it within ourselves to resist evil impulses. This person said, yeah, you can see it there, can't you? He said, I discovered in prison that faith in myself alone was ultimately no match for the cruelty that human beings could devise when they were entirely unencumbered by respect for the God-given dignity of man. In the Hanoi Hilton, John McCain saw things that would lead a man to cry out and say, oh Lord, judge the wicked. Oh, Lord, do to them what they've done to us. Oh, Lord, bring justice. He saw the barbaric impulses of the human heart, and by the way, he knew that his own heart could go there easily. Folks, that's what we've got to keep in mind here. Apart from God's restraining grace, your own heart could be just as barbaric. Don't think that the Nazi soldiers were somehow not thinking. They were just able to rationalize their evil. The, the imprecatory psalms remind us it's not good to rationalize your evil. It's not good for you to lose sight of the fact that evil exists, evil exists in you, and, and we want God to stamp out evil in our own heart through grace and in our world through judgment against those who refuse to bow the knee to him. So you think about your hatred of evil and your, your gratitude for God's grace in your own life to deal with your own evil as you prepare your heart to come to the table. Let me just say for those of you who are visitors with us, we practice open communion, which means there's a burden on you here this morning, and the burden on you is to say, should I come to the table? And the people who should come to the table are those who are in the family of God, those who have surrendered their lives to Christ, those who would say, I belong to him, my life is about serving him, I want his glory in me, you come to the table to receive grace to strengthen and sustain you as you recommit your life to him. If you're here this morning and, and you would say, yeah, I haven't come to that place yet in my life. Well, rather than coming and receiving bread and juice and just going through a ritual, the Bible says don't do that if you're not in Christ because if you do that, you're bringing judgment on yourself. You're, you're, you are taking the Lord, these elements in vain. Don't come if you haven't surrendered your life to Christ. If you haven't, if you haven't given your life to Christ, 
there'll be some stuff on the screen for you to consider and read as the rest of us come forward to receive these elements. We're not trying to keep something from you. In fact, God says this table is open, but you have to bow the knee first. You have to surrender your life to him first. And as you prepare your heart to come, just ask yourself, ask the Lord to reveal, is there any hidden sin in me? Is there anything that's keeping me from, from uh, walking with you? Is there any area where I'm stubbornly resisting? I'm, I'm not... I'm not ready to give up the evil. I want to. I want to keep it there. A ask God to deal with that as you come this morning. Strength to fight against your own sin. You prepare your heart while I prepare the table here.